भगवते वसुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवाय यम प्रव्रजंथ मनुपेत मतेत कृत्यम द्वैपायना विरह कातराजुहाव पुत्रे तन्मयतयो तरभो विनेदुस तम सार्वभूत हृदय मुनिमानतोस्मी नारायण नमस्कृत नरम चरोतम देवी सरस्वती व्यास तथोजया मुदीर नष्ट प्रयेशु नित्यं भागवत सेवया भगवत्युत श्लोक भक्तिर्भावती नस्ति We are reading Shrimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10, Chapter 14, Brahma's Prayer to Lord Krishna, Text Number 12. Ukshepanam Garbha Gatasya Padayoho Kim Kalpate Matuhu Adhokshaja Agase Kim Asti Na Asti Vyapadesha Bhushitam Tava Asti Kukshehe Kiyat Ati Anantaha Utkshepanam garbhagatasya padayo Utkshepanam garbhagatasya padayo Kim kalpate matura dhoksha jagase किं कल्पते मधुरधोक्षजागसे किमस्ति नस्ति व्यपदेशभूषितम् किमस्ति नस्ति व्यपदेशभूषितम् तवस्ति कुक्षे केदाप्यानंता तवस्ति कुक्षे कियदाप्यनंता उत्क्षेपनम् गर्भगतस्य पादयो किम कल्पते मातुरादोक्षजागसे किमस्ति नस्ति व्यपदेशभूषितम् तवस्ति कुक्षे कियदाप्यनंता Shabhushitam 
ಶ್ರೀ ಪುಕ್ಷೇಷ್ಟಿಯದಾತ್ಯನಂತ ಮಾತಜೆ ಉತ್ಕ್ಷೇಪನ ದ ಕಿಕಿಂಗ್ ಗರ್ಭಾಗತ ಆಫ್ ಅ ಚೈಲ್ಡ್ ಇನ್ ದ ವೂಂಬ್ ಪಾದ ಆಫ್ ದ ಲೆಗ್ಸ್ ಕಿಂ ವಾಟ್ ಕಲ್ಪತೆ ಅಮೌಂಟ್ಸ್ ಟು ಮಾತು ಫಾರ್ ದ ಮಾದರ್ ಅಧೋಕ್ಷಜ ಓ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸೆಂಟಲ್ ಲೋರ್ಡ್ agase as an offense kim what asti it exists na asti it does not exist via padesha by designations bushitam decorated tava your asti there is kukshe of the abdomen kiyat how much api even anantaha external translation by his divine grace a ac bhaktivedanta swami prabhat <clears throat> o lord adhokshaja does a mother takes offense when the child within her womb kicks with his legs and is there anything in the existence whether designated by various philosophers as real or as unreal that is actually outside your abdomen purport shila prabhupad comments as follows on this verse in krishna the supreme personality of godhead volume 1 chapter 14 lord brahma therefore compared himself to a little child within the womb of his mother If the child was in the womb plays with his hands and legs and while playing touches the body of the mother is the mother offended with this child of course she isn't similarly lord brahma may be a very great personality and yet not only brahma but everything that exists is within the womb of the supreme personality of god it the lord's energy is all pervading there is no place in the creation where there is no uh, when it is not acting everything is existing within the energy of the lord so the brahma of this universe or the brahmas of the many other millions and trillions of the universes are existing within the energy of the lord therefore the lord is considered to be the mother and everything existing within the womb of the mother is considered to be the child and the good mother is never offended with the child 
Even if he touches the body of the mother by kicking his legs. Shila Prabhupada ki. Utkshepanam garbagatasya padayo kim kalpate matur adhoksha jagase kim asti nasti vyapadesha bushitam tavasti kukse kiyadapi anantaha. O Lord Adokshaja, does a mother take offense when the child within her womb kicks with his legs? And is there anything in the existence, whether designated by various philosophers as real or as unreal, that is actually outside your abdomen? O Magyana Timirandasya Gyanam jana salakaya Chaksurun militam yena Tasmai Shri Gurave namaha Shri Chaitanya mano vishtam Stapitam yena bhutale Svayam rupa kadamahyam Dadati svapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Pada Kamalam, Shri Gurun Vaishnavam Scha, Shri Rupam Sagrajatam, Sagana Ragunatam Vitam, Tam Sajivam, Sadvaitam Savadutam, Parijana Sahitam, Krishna Chaitanya Devam, Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sagana Lalita Shri Vishakha Vitamsha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopisha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurange Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyasya Kripa Sindhu Vyayvacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nitananda Shri Advaita Gadathara Shri Vasadigora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Ajanu Lambita Bujo Kanaka Vadatu, Sankirtanai Kapitaro Kamalaya Taksha, Vishwambaro Dvijavaro Yuga Dharma Palo, Vande Jagat Priyakaro, Karuna Vataro, Yantah pravishya mama vacha mamam prasuptam sanji vayada kila shakti darak svadamna anyam shahasta charana shravanat vagadim prananamo bhagavate purushaya tubyam. Hare Krishna. Uh, great honor for me to speak in front of all of you. I feel myself completely undeserving and unqualified, but I'll try as a service to all of you to say a few words about this particular verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, 
Lord Brahma being the original teacher of the whole universe very clearly understood his mistake and he is expressing the very essence of the faulty mentality of living entities in his prayers and the main point which he makes again and again and again is that my problem and my fault was that I tried to measure you who is unlimited and immeasurable this is a very basic characteristic of a human mind or any conditioned mind in this universe because we are here to measure everything Sila Bhaktivinoda Thakur is giving a very beautiful definition taken I believe from Vedic literature of Maya he says Miyate Anaya Iti Maya Maya by the very definition is our attempt to bring something closer to us to measure it Miyate means measuring in fact English word measure is coming from the Sanskrit word Miyate Miyate Anaya Anaya you approach you bring it closer to you for this very purpose you want to measure it and it is Maya if you try this it means you are in Maya and uh, we have to very clearly understand how it works in our own mentality to understand how deeply we are in Maya. <clears throat> People, they have this habit, they want to measure everything and they are bringing, they are coming closer to others just to measure, measure them. They look down at people, you know, and basically that's a very standard mentality. Whoever we looked upon, we just try to see how he is less than myself. This is basically the main reason why we are coming closer to anything. We just want to show I am greater than you. You know, there is a standard kind of dialogue between two people with Bika Hankar. Who you think you are? And the standard answer is that who you think you are? You know. Who are you? You know, and I am it's obvious who I am. I am the Lord of creation. <laughs> and who are you? <laughs> who you think you are? <laughs> so uh, that's unfortunately the manifestation of our pride and we're looking at everything with this particular uh, mentality that we want to measure uh, uh, how big it is. Yesterday, Srila Radhanath Maharaj was explaining yet that one teaspoon is trying to measure the ocean. And teaspoon says, I'm a very big teaspoon. I'm not a ordinary teaspoon I'm a big teaspoon let me measure this ocean <laughs> so uh, and that's exactly what we are doing constantly on a daily basis and that's the reason why we are here and unless we change this mentality unless we change this particular uh, outlook of the world unless we change this uh, approach to everything which we see, uh, we will not change our situation in this world. We will remain in this world, we may be a little higher, little, you know, um, we may get position which is little more advantageous 
to measure everyone. <laughs> you know, getting a higher position, we may take lower position, but, you know, it, it will all remain the same. Because this is the reason why we are remaining in the limited world. In this world, everything is limited to facilitate our desire to measure. Everything is limited, and we are uh, very enthusiastically taking this opportunity to measure everything. You know, the famous example is one king, you know, I don't know which number, king, number, George, number, whatever. You know, he, he said that from now on, the measure of all, of all things will be my foot. So, since then, we have the foot, the measure of all the things, his foot, you know. His foot is the measure of everything, you know. This is, you know, <laughs> this is a ridiculous example, but basically, that's what we are trying to do. This is my foot, now I will measure, I will put my foot everywhere. <laughs> And uh, this is what is going on, and this is the problem of uh, the human mind, or uh, conditioned mind. That's maya. When we are, try, uh, that we are trying to measure, uh, in order to prove our own greatness, our attempt to measure everything and anything in this world, or everybody, uh, is just basically to prove to oneself that I'm greater. Because the very, um, the very fact that I can measure something means that I'm greater. You know, like scientists. The very good example of this are scientists because they're trying to measure everything. In fact, the modern science, what it is, science, what it is, it is, it is just an attempt to measure, you know, whether you measure a little atom or you measure the big universe. You feel good when you're measuring universe, you know. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous, you know, but the mentality which is behind this, I know. I know what it is, and I know what it is means I can measure it. Yeah, it is little greater than me, that's fine. You know, I know how much greater it is, but because I'm measuring it, I'm greater. Because I'm doing this, I'm ultimately greater, you know. Then when the scientists are trying to, to do this, is the, the very approach stinks. It's rotten. The approach is rotten because what they're trying to do, they're trying to uh, measure everything and anything, and for that they have to really... And again, this is another manifestation of human mentality. To measure something or somebody, you have to make it uh, bad. Uh, this is my confession in front of all of you. I, I'm a scientist. You know, sometimes some people and Pradhan and Maharaj, they want to say he's a PhD scientist. This is, the, this is a very... I mean, it's a, uh, all the time when I hear this, this is a big humiliation. It reminds me about the, this very problem which I have. So uh, when I was I was biochemistry scientist, and I was trying to study the life, but how the scientists are trying to study the life by killing. That's the only way to study the life. According to the scientists, you just you take a rat and you kill it and say this is life. <laughs> this is how this is how life works. <laughs> but this is a problem. This is a problem which manifests in so many different ways. And the problem of pride, which particularly manifests in our approach, and when we are proud of ourselves and when we approach other people, we approach them by trying to measure them. Look, by pointing out, this is your quality, this is your quality. All the time we are doing this. You know, what is the greatness of a real saint? What is the greatness of Srila Radhanath Maharaj? Yesterday, 
so many devotees spoke about this that is, he's not measuring. He's accepting, and accepting means not measuring. Accepting means he's approaching people with a different purpose. When we approach people, we just try to look down at them and, you know, measure and see, this is this, and this is it, and this is it. But accepting others means you take different position. You look at them, not from up. You look at them, you know, by accepting. You know, who you are, who you think you are to measure others. <laughs> Where nobody, and uh, again, this is, this is a mistake. You know, there is a very interesting example about the scientist coming back to our, to my favorite topic. <laughs> and Prabhupada, that's why he was so heavy about the scientist. Sometimes people don't like it. You know, Prabhupada said, I kick him with my boot. You know, he's, he's trying to do with scientists exactly what Lord Brahma is saying, I, I, I did with you, O Krishna, <laughs> by kicking you. <laughs> so I kicked Darwin by my foot. <laughs> that was Prabhupada's uh, disgust about this very attempt. Because again, this attempt is just to create problems. Scientists think that by this approach we will solve all the problems. They create problems. Because ultimately, this is, uh, this is not going to solve the problems. It will aggravate the problems. So, a beautiful example of it is very interesting. Recently, I read an article. This is, a, you know, the uh, new achievement in the modern astronomy. The astronomers, before they used to say there was a big bang, bang, you know, and the universe appeared. Haribo. Very nice news, you know. As a result of this big bang, they're a little crazy. <laughs> it's a natural result of a big bang because, you know, and, and something big explodes, you know, there's some problem with the brain. <laughs> But anyway, so the, the, before there was this Big Bang theory that at one point, you know, something, some vacuum, you know, exploded. How the vacuum can explode, you know, is, don't ask me, ask them. But, <laughs> but it exploded anyway. So, but now they say the new theory is that it explodes all the time. It doesn't explode once. It explodes again and again and again. And the new theory, which is very recent, uh, one English Oxford astronomer, Penrose, together with one Armenian astronomer, they found out, due some observation, that uh, there is a cycles in the universe. And they explained in a very beautiful way uh, the life cycle of the universe. Again, the attempt to measure how the universe lives for how long and this and that. And they say that universe, first it explodes, something explodes, and then, you know, the universe appear. And then after some time, after billions and billions of years, and they know the exact uh, number of years, it goes back to the black hole and remains in the black hole uh, for some time to energize itself and then the block, black hole explodes again and the universes appear again. And when I read this, I heard, yes, this is written in Srimad Bhagavatam. This black hole is the pore on uh, Mahavishnu's body. You know, the universe is coming from this pore and then, you know, and for them it's a big black hole, you know. <laughs> And they specifically say <laughs> that the universe is coming into this black hole to get energized again for the new explosion. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's a new theory, but uh, by coincidence, it is described in Srimad Bhagavatam 5,000 years back. 
But uh, again, uh, this is this is how it works. They are trying to discover something which is already discovered. <laughs> and ultimately, when they study, uh, if they are really good scientists, they they will come to understand this is this is what Brahma is confessing here. He says, "I tried it. I am an original scientist." And that's a fact. Brahma is an original scientist because he was the one who dove uh, deep trying to find the origin of the universe. When he was born in a lotus, you know. He was the one who was, by experimental way, was trying to find out the cause of all causes. Uh, it didn't work with him. You know, he, he couldn't. And here he says, again and again and again, the same thing. He says, He says, the first thing which you have to do to understand God, and to understand anything in this creation, to understand yourself, to understand anything in fact, the first thing which you have to do, Gyane prayasim, udapasya namanta eva. You have to get rid of this attempt to understand something with your brain. What you have to do, you have to bow down. That's the way uh, to uh, understand anything. To understand anything, you have to bow down. This is the secret of Vedic culture. The Vedic culture, culture teaches this very... Uh, uh, this very low <laughs> that if you want to understand something you have to worship this and our um, anything which we do in this world has to be an act of worship when the musicians in, uh, in the modern you know world play they play you know they play because they just want to show how they are great. When a musician in uh, Vedic culture plays, he first bows down and pays his obeisances to the instrument. I'm not playing. <laughs> I'm an instrument. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm worshipping this instrument so that I can perform something. And whatever you take, you know, if we take any act... Uh, the teaching, the essential teaching of Vedic culture is to teach us how to worship everything and anything. And, you know, modern people, they mock and deride this Vedic culture. They say these primitive people, they, they worship stones. They worship trees. They worship rivers. Yeah, but they're not primitive people. Ultimately, they worship God. But because they worship God, they worship everything else. This is a beautiful and very powerful point which Sri Radhanath Maharaj made yesterday. He said, if you are humble, you are humble in front of everything. And if you are not humble in front of anything, you are not humble. <laughs> you may temporarily accept a guise of humility in front of somebody who is great, just to get something from him. But this is not humility. Humility means you are humble in front of everything. <laughs> and ultimately, uh, we have to be humble in front of God. And our lack of humility manifests in this desire to measure everything, to, to say, I am greater. So this is the teaching of Vedic culture uh, to teach us how to live in this world in a proper way without distraction. It is also beautifully described here in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, where this is the only verse where the name of Srimati Radharani slips out from the lotus mouth of Sukadev Goswami. What he says? Anaya radito nunam. Miyate anaya iti maya. Maya means. Uh, I bring something closer to me to measure. Shimati Radharani, by teaching us, teaching us by her example, uh, Sukadev Goswami says what she does. 
Anaya Aradito Nunam. Why she is called Rada? Because she is the best of the worshippers. Because whatever she brings closer to herself, Anaya bringing closer, Aradito Nunam, indeed. Whatever she does, uh, she is worshipping. Whatever we do, we are trying to measure. And that's the difference between Maya and uh, the situation or position outside of Maya. Uh, this is what uh, we are supposed to learn if we want to change something categorically within our heart. This is what we are supposed to learn in Krishna consciousness movement. How to worship. How to worship each and every devotee. How to worship the Lord, but not only the Lord. That's a mistake which uh, Prakrita Bhakta uh, usually does. He says, yes, 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 I worship the Lord, fine. But I will measure everyone else. Look how great I am and how bad you are. That's a mistake. And this, is, this means materialism within our brain, within our, our head. Uh, that's, that's why the beginners are called Prakrita Bhakta. They are materialistic devotees because the same mentality is there. They accept, formally they accept the Lord. But that's a formality. There is no real acceptance of the Lord in a real sense. <clears throat> and as I said, and it's a very, also a very important point, unless and until uh, this mentality is there, the destructive that this mentality means destructive mentality. This very mentality means the destruction of everything around you and the destruction ultimately of yourself. You know, Ahankar is the destructive element in this creation. That's why Lord Shiva is the destroyer. He is Coincidentally, the Lord of Ahankar. <laughs> he is the Lord of presiding deity of the false ego, and therefore, you know, ultimately, because his false ego is, you know, he destroys everything. This is, this is explained by Lord Shiva himself in Brihad Bhagavatamritam. In Brihad Bhagavatamritam, when Narada Muni comes to him and praises him and saying, You are the best devotee of the Lord, you can't. You, you ask the mercy of the Lord to the greatest extent, Lord Shiva becomes very morose and says, this is a mistake. <laughs> Look what I did. I was fighting with my Lord. <laughs> I was fighting because of Ahankar, because of Paul Siga. And ultimately, that's what we have to very clearly understand. Why do we have to die? Because of Paul Siga. Those who don't have false ego, they don't die. They become immortal. <laughs> they get the immortality, <laughs> the nectar of immortality. <laughs> uh, the false ego is the very cause of destruction starting with our own self. We're destroying ourselves. The false ego, we can study it very beautifully. There are so many examples, and our own example is closer than anything to us, how our false ego is is destroying uh, everything, destroying our lives, ultimately. So, uh, therefore, this is what we have to really clearly understand, and this is the teaching of Lord Brahma. Lord Brahma is saying here, you know, I did this mistake, please forgive me. Somebody, he says, somebody may measure, you know, he's coming Again and again and again to this point. Somebody may measure, Srila Radhan and Maharaj was explaining, all the flakes of the snow and all the atoms in the rays of the sun, you know, but he will never be able to measure you. <laughs> this is what I have realized. This is, this is the humility. And, you know, until we have this mentality, the... Uh, the curtain of Maya will always be in front of our eyes. We will never see the Lord. With these eyes, 
which are trying to measure and trying to envy and trying to, you know, to show and to prove our greatness. With these eyes, we cannot see the Lord. Premanjana churite bhakti vilochanena santaksa daiva hridayeshu vilokayanti yam shyama sundaram achintya guna svarupam. You will be able to see the achintya guna svarupam of the Lord only when you change your eyes. The mental eyes which we have, only if we have the eyes which are, uh, you know, which are smeared with the self of love, premanjana churita bhakti vilochanena, then only maya will disappear. Before that, we will suffer. Before that, there will be sufferings just because of this little, little bug within the program of our mind. You know, this is the bug, you know, which you have to discover and get rid of. You know, it's a small bug, <laughs> but it's there. So, uh, that's, uh, that's what it is. The, uh, we, we will be deprived of this nectar of connection with the Lord. And when the connection with the Lord is there, then, then all the problems are solved. Unless this is, uh, this is solved, this problem is solved, we will remain here, suffering one way or another, until it is completely eradicated. You know, the problem with the false ego, the big problem with the false ego is that, you know, we know about the liver. The liver can regenerate itself, even if there is some they say if 10% of the liver is there, it can totally regenerate itself. You know, but the problem with false ego is that even if 1% of it is still there, it can totally 100% regenerate itself. <laughs> it's, just, it's a complete regeneration. With no time. For liver it takes some time. <laughs> for, for false ego, you know... You get humiliated, you know, Krishna arranges something, Krishna beautifully arranges so many different lessons for us. He arranges uh, one lesson after another lesson after another lesson, just to show how insignificant we are. And, you know, for the time being, our false ego uh, getting a little diminished, but we keep a little bit for the future. <laughs> and, you know... Uh, just a few minutes later, you're again proud. Just before you were so humble, you know, something happened to you, some suffering. And usually it's suffering. Suffering makes us humble. Therefore, sufferings are good. People in this world, they don't like sufferings, you know. Nobody goes to astrologers and asks astrologers, please explain me how to get more sufferings in this world. I need it, because otherwise I'm so proud. <laughs> Nobody says this. Everyone goes and says how to get rid of all the sufferings which are there. But sufferings are good, because it's a bitter medicine. When we get some suffering, we, we become a little more healthy, but we keep the very root of the disease inside, the false ego. Little, my, it's just little, little. We have, we are very humble, you know, very humble. Just little ahankar should be there, otherwise how I can survive, right? How I can protect myself, you know. Ahankar is good because ahankar is just, you know. <laughs> ahankar is a very nice protective device in this world, right? <laughs> so, this is the problem. The problem is that we keep a little bit and then it grows up to the full size, very quickly, without noticing. And Krishna says, yes, this guy is again needs some little treatment. Some bitter treatment is necessary. <laughs> because, because actually only bitter taste, the bitter taste is the most medicinal taste. You know, the sweet taste is the most horrible taste. The sweet taste is the cause, according to Ayurveda, it's the cause of all the ama, all the toxins which are there. And if you want to get rid, you should take little bitter things. <laughs> you know, this Mahatikta Grita. Mahatikta. 
So this Mahatikta Grita, very bitter Grita, is given by the Lord on a regular basis to keep us <laughs> little healthy. Otherwise, it's not possible. Therefore, Krishna himself says, Dukhalai Masasvatam. That's the reason. Sometimes people say, you know, why, why, if God is good, why did he create it? such a miserable world exactly because he's good. That's the exact reason why he created such a miserable place for us to live. Because if it was not, you know, anyway, we would create miseries anyway, <laughs> even if he didn't try it. But that's, that's again, the, this is the root cause. And uh, this is, and this is what we happen, what happened with Brahma. Brahma, he got little bitter medicine, but again, you know, comes back. You know, he's now in Vrindavan, and in Vrindavan he is a little humiliated, and he's humble, and he's seeing Vrindavan. He's seeing the beauty of Vrindavan. Actually, the first verse of these prayers is very beautiful. Now immediately, Brava Pusheta Didambaraya Gunjavatam Saparitichilasan Mukhaya. It's a, I mean, it's an amazingly beautiful verse. Lord Brahma says, he sees Krishna. He sees it, and he's, he's again wondering, you know, you're so simple. Gunjavatamsa, you have this Gunjamala, and this Gunjamala is not jewels from Vaikuntha. And you are so simple, you know, you have this Paripichalasan Mukhaya, you know, you, you have this uh, peacock feather, and, you know, you have all these simple flowers. And Mridupade, your feet are so small and so soft, so tender. Mridupade. And Pashupangajaya, you live among this Pashupangajaya, those people, you know, Pashupangadas who keep animals. You are born from this very low people. He is actually praising Krishna's humility. <laughs> he says, I am so puffed up. I am a big creator. I have four heads. You know, and look at me. And why I am so puffed up? Uh, Kavi Karnapur actually says that, uh, that Brahma uh, wanted to use his intelligence as a yardstick to measure Krishna's powers. But then he sees this. Uh, why be exactly because Krishna didn't manifest his opulence? Brahma is used to reciprocate with Krishna in a different form. And this Sahastra Shirsha Purushaha, you know, this is the, the, the favorite hymn of Brahma. You know, the, this Sahastra Shirsha Purusha, the Purusha with thousand heads and thousand eyes and thousand legs is living in Brahma's planet in Satyaloka. This Purusha is there, you know. And Brahma sees this and, you know, this is his conception of the Lord. So many heads and so many eyes and so many legs. And when he sees only two, two, only one head <laughs> and two arms and, he's, you know, it cannot be God. <laughs> And he sees all these simple things. And in the first verse, he exactly says, you know, that uh, uh, somehow or other this Maya disappeared and I, I am appreciating your greatness, which manifests in simplicity. People, proud people, they cannot appreciate simplicity. They cannot, because, you know, for them simplicity is not very valuable. So Brahma is saying this, I couldn't do this. You know, the Samacharyas say that what really freaked out Brahma is that Krishna kept this yogurt and rice in his left hand. And that was too much for Brahma. You know, he's a vidi. Vidi means all the rules and regulations. And Brahma said, he is God and he doesn't know that you are not supposed to eat with the left hand. What kind of God he is? <laughs> he is, and, and Krishna just, to mock him, he's still keeping this in his left hand. He's saying, Jesus, look. You. 
<laughs> forget about these rules and regulations. I'm here in Vrindavan. I'm not for the rules and regulations. I'm just... Uh, this is a different purpose, different thing. And, uh, of course, you know, in these prayers, the Lord Brahma, is speaking from the heart. He is expressing his appreciation. And ultimately, what he says, and this, that was an introduction to the verse which we read today. <laughs> so, <laughs> but what he says here, it's actually very interesting. He ultimately says that, you know, I realized your greatness. And I realized that my mistake was that I couldn't appreciate your greatness which manifested as a simplicity. Because, again, because of this mentality. You know, people with this measuring mentality, they can appreciate great things. You know, they still measure them, but they still can appreciate them. But if some, when they see something simple, you know, no, no, forget it. They can't appreciate this. And Brahma says, yes, I realized my mistake. I know that the millions and trillions of universes are coming from your body like the atoms from the, from the window, like the little particles of dust. When you see the, the window, you know, and the rays of the sun is coming, you, you can see the little particles of the dust. And he says, this is what universe, which I am ruling of, is in comparison with you. So small and insignificant it is in comparison with you. Uh, but here he says, uh, actually he gives to Lord Brahma three reasons, uh, to, to Lord Krishna, three reasons why uh, Krishna should forgive him. He gives three reasons. First in this verse, second in the next verse, and the third one in the verse after that. He said, first reason, the main reason is that you are like mother. He says, I am in your womb. And when the child is kicking mother from within the womb, mother is not offended, rather mother is happy. He says, you, you should be happy because I kicked you. And he also, uh, by the way, he also says adoxaja. Adoxaja means Krishna who was lying under the cart and he was kicking the cart who killed this demon, he says, you also kicking, so you know. You know. <laughs> you know. I'm kicking, you are kicking. So this, uh, I mean, after all, you were forgiven. Please forgive me. <laughs> he says, when I was kicking this, and, uh, you know, when you were kicking this, all this, you know, bridge of buses, they forgave you, so you please forgive me. I also kicked you. So we are more or less the same. That's why he called him Adhoksaja. Adoxygen means one of the meaning of this word adoxygen, one who was born again under the cart. So he is reminding Krishna about this. So this is the one reason, because the mother is the most forgiving. Then he says, he goes, he gives even more serious reason. He says, this is the, you know, he's approaching Lord Brahma with this, uh, you know, approaching Sorry, Lord Krishna saying that you are merciful like a mother and ultimately the whole creation is your womb. So, you know, what is unusual for you? Then he says, you're like father. And he says, father, you know, he doesn't take seriously, you know, all the offenses of his son. He is also forgiving. This is the father nature. And it's little... I mean, a little more strict condition. Fathers are a little more strict than mothers. He first say, you're like mother. Then he says, you're like father also. That's another reason why you have to forgive me. And then the next verse says, uh, ultimately you are Narayana. And Narayana means, uh, you know, all the living entities are within you. And therefore you are very tolerable. You should tolerate me as well. You're, after all, you are tolerating everyone else. So he gives this three reasons in the, you know, he, he finished uh, describing his mistake and uh, describing the greatness of Lord Krishna. And here he gives to Lord Krishna three reasons why he should be forgiven. Uh, he is begging forgiveness from Lord Krishna. 
But uh, ultimately, uh, we have again to understand that the main lesson which Lord Brahman, Lord Krishna, in fact, are uh, given giving here to us is that uh, we have to really uh, be humble and worship everything each and every living entity <laughs> because this is the this is the manifestation of Krishna any particle of this creation we should worship you know ants we should worship <laughs> Bhaktivinoda Thakur says that this is one of the problems of a living entity that we don't we, we, we commit violence towards others <laughs> Therefore, this is the, the mentality of a real Vaishnava. And when the real Vaishnava uh, develops this mentality, then a very amazing transformation may take place. This is the last thing which I, uh, I will say, explaining this uh, drama which took place 5,000 years ago in Vrindavan. You know, sometimes when we, we hear... Bridgebas is talking in front of Krishna. They are very proud, isn't it? You know, if you if you read some Rasika literature, you know, you you will see there is a lot of these proud statements. I read recently, Sridam is speaking to Krishna and says, Krishna, why are you so proud? He is saying, you know, why are you so proud? I will show you. Siddham is challenging Krishna. He is trying to fight with him and he is saying, you know, I'm, why are you so proud? I will prove to everyone that I am stronger than you and you will carry me on your shoulders. I will be, I will be on your shoulders very soon. You will see it. And he says, why are you so proud? You are proud, you're proud because, the Putin, because you killed Putana, right? It's not you who killed Putana. It's all the Brahmanas who chanted mantras. They killed Putana. And why are you so proud? You think you killed Agasura, right? But you forgot that we entered in the belly of Agasura first. <laughs> There's no reason for you to be proud. And then he says, why are you so proud? You're proud because you lifted Govardhan Hill, right? You know, but you didn't leave Govardhan Hill. Govardhan Hill was so happy with our worship that Govardhan Hill just jumped in the air himself. You know, you shouldn't be. There is no reason for you to be proud. <laughs> so, this is, this is bridge passes. And we are not supposed to imitate them, you know. We come in front of Radha Gopinath and say, you know, who you think, who you, think you are? <laughs> It will not be very pleasing to them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> devotees on a very high level, they can do this. <laughs> there, was, there was one great saint in Vrindavan. And once he came to the temple, and he, you know, he stood in front of the deity of the, of the Lord, and then he turned his back uh, to the deity of the Lord, which is in itself quite offensive, because you're not supposed to turn your back, you're supposed to you know, kind of go by your face. And then he started kind of kicking his, his legs, you know, by, you know, making these movements of the legs so that, you know, the dust of, of, uh, from his foot would go to the Lord. And, uh, and then somebody asked, why are you doing this? He says, Krishna himself says that I'm following my devotee to get some dust from his feet. And that's exactly what I'm doing. He wants, he wants it. Anubrajami, Mad Bhakta. Krishna says this in the, in the 11th canto of Sivan Bhagavatam. And he says, this is what I'm doing. Because he wants some dust from my feet. So the point is that we are not supposed to do this. This is on a very high level. Krishna takes pleasure in this reciprocation uh, with the... Uh, great devotees but uh, on our level uh, we have to become humble <laughs> the main teaching of Srimad Bhagavatam which is universal and all these things is a manifestation of the deepest possible humility when Sridam says this or when Srimati Radharani 
gets angry at Krishna or when whatever. It's the manifestation of the deepest possible humility. It's a strange manifestation, but still it's, <laughs> it's a manifestation of real humility, of a real bhakta. So the general teachings, which is again and again and again uh, manifested here in Srimad Bhagavatam, is that we should develop the real humility without any trace of false ego by understanding who Krishna is and who we are in front of him <laughs> by understanding our real position and developing qualities of kindness uh, humility forgiveness this is all qualities which Lord Brahma is saying you know this is this is what the devotion is devotion is not just a slogan bhakti not a slogan bhakti is the condition of the heart and uh, Lord Brahma is teaching us uh, how we should become humble anyway thank you very much Srila Prabhupada ki any yeah yeah please be Hare Prabhupada Hare Krishna Thank you so much, Maharaj. You know, this point you are explaining very, very uh, striking about how we want to measure others rather than accept them. And then you are also explaining how Vedic culture means worship and modern culture is like measuring, <coughs> which is a manifestation of the false ego. And then you give the example of a Kanishta Adhikari who worships God but is measuring everyone. So I wanted to share, uh, ask you this question because, you know, I don't know whether it's a slightly different experience. But I know some other devotees also have this experience that when we are new, you know, we worship Krishna, we worship God and we also like all devotees and we respect them, we consider them. Mm. I know we are naive, we are maybe foolish, but we, we have that simplicity, you know, that innocence is there, we mm. like everything in bhakti. But as we grow older, we become managers, we understand the, you know, issues in so many things, we become little cynical and then cynical... And then the simple things we are not able to appreciate. You know, we become suspicious. And then sometimes we are assured by our seniors, don't worry, you are becoming mature now. But more than mature, I feel that, you know, that innocence is lost. And how can we again love everyone and have that simplicity in Krishna? <laughs> and how we can, because, you know, uh, all that is okay, management and everything. But then uh, there is no, the taste is not there. Then anarthas come up. So, how do we become simple? How do we become uh, what you are saying, you know, being simple at heart? How can we become? Not measure others. How can mm -hmm. we actually become like this? Yeah, when we come to bhakti because we uh, underwent this very powerful experience of conversion, this powerful experience keeps us humble for some time and gives us a lot of you know, good energy to go and we really like everyone. But then again, you know, because we kept little false ego, <laughs> you know, ultimately you just kind of become familiar and false ego grows back and you say, yeah, 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 right, right. I know all these bhaktas, I know, I know them, I know. They're all, they're all pretenders, you know. Before you saw everyone, everyone is a pure devotee, you, only, you, you, you had this Mahabhagavata vision. You know? <laughs> everyone is a pure devotee, only I'm a rascal. <laughs> but then, every, very soon, everyone is a rascal, I'm a pure devotee. <laughs> the switch is kind of, again, uh, turned on. Because, you know, the pride was still there. And uh, this is when the real work starts. The real work starts here. This is called Bhajana Kriya. When, when you, you know, when you associate with other devotees and try to, you know, befriend them and try to take care. Therefore, this is so important. The main teaching of Srila Radhanand Maharaj is that you have to remain in the society of the devotees and in the society of the devotees you have to manifest the three kinds of relationship. The care for those who are junior to you, the friendship for those who are equal to you and the worship and respect towards who are uh, 
Monsignor, this is this is the work, the daily work which we have to do to keep to you know to reduce our ego again and again and again. And especially, therefore, uh, Maharaj so beautifully he stresses this association with equals because in one sense it's easy to be caring with juniors and it's easy to be respectful to seniors at least externally but it's very difficult to be (laughs) really friendly with equals so this is the real kind of cure for the for the ego and uh, when this relationship are established in this relationship especially in in the relationship with equals you keep the simplicity because what is simplicity simplicity is uh, and if, if your heart melts in this relationship then the simplicity comes back that's the only thing you know if the heart melts and in the relationship, then the simplicity comes. Because the simplicity is a condition of melted heart. Of the heart which is... Then if the heart is soft and <coughs> kind of melted due to relationship, the simplicity is there. The natural respect is there. Actually, respect, care, friendship is the natural qualities of the soul. The pride is unnatural. It's superimposed upon the soul. Uh, So, and simplicity is also very natural virtue of the soul. So, when in this relationship we rediscover, uh, and relationship means the relationship between the soul and soul, between heart and heart. Otherwise, there is no relationship. There is no relationship between false ego and false ego. No, there is a relationship. It's called clash. <laughs> and fa- fighting and whatever it is. So, the simplicity comes back when there is relationship. And therefore, Maharaj stresses this point. Simple. Very simple. And uh, yesterday had this beautiful program and it was so so brightly manifested and shown there you know that's what what he wants he teaches bhakti but you know and bhakti is for the lord no doubt about it but you know to learn bhakti you have to be in the society of devotees <laughs> and you have to establish yourself in a very proper way in the society of devotees. Yes, Padaji. <coughs> Thank you, that was a very nice class. It's nice to hear more about the false ego. It's not really explained enough, I feel. Um, I had a question. I was speaking from my own experience. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I was curious, the false ego, can it be, when we start to try to go in this process of purifying our false ego, can it, what exactly happens to it? Does it get eradicated? Does it really start to disappear? Or is it just that our mind is simply being able to control it more? And what are some practical things we can do to help to control the false ego on a daily basis thank you oh, Lord Krishna explains what false ego is ahankara vimudatma kartaham iti manyate the <clears throat> false ego is this mentality kartaham I am karta I am the doer this two Aspects of false ego is uh, uh, kartritva and boktritva. The agency, I am the doer, and uh, the enjoyership. Doership and enjoyership, kartritva and boktritva. So, 
you know, the false ego is the very foundation of enjoyment in this world. In fact, you cannot enjoy without false ego. <laughs> so, because you have this understanding, I am this, and I am that, and I achieved this, and I am doing this, and look what I am, what have I done, look how charitable I am, look how good I am, look how caring I am, you know, so many different manifestations of false ego are there. If uh, this concept of I is there, then uh, accompanying this concept of I will be the concept of mine. This is my achievement. This is, and I am enjoying the fruits of my actions. So, the simple recipe of Krishna, which he gives in Bhagavad Gita, uh, how to control the false ego, is that to understand, uh, I am not the doer, you are not the doer. And not to try to enjoy the fruits, because this is what reinforces the false ego. The enjoyment of the fruits of our actions is what feeds our false ego on a daily basis. Look, you know, this is, this is coming for me. Krishna explains this in the 16th chapter when he says, you know, Ishwaraha Maham uh, so What is this? Yeah. Siddhoham, I am perfect. Balavan, I am very strong. Sukhi, I am very happy. I am very happy in this world. This is how false ego works. Uh, you know, I am enjoying in this world uh, because of my intelligence, because of this and that. So, uh, this is the mentality which we have to be very watchful about. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm so intelligent. You know who you are. You know you're not so intelligent. You are not Albert Einstein, and you know. Uh, what to speak about Lord Brahma and uh, so th this this concept I, 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 I uh, false ego, I achieved this I, you know uh, uh, because of my skills I am a very expert player I am a very expert speaker you know so I am very caring uh, this is all different concepts of false ego and therefore uh, on a daily basis, we have to watch, and especially during our sadhana practices, we have to chant in a proper mood. I am not the doer. Nothing depends on me. Uh, <coughs> Krishna is everything, <laughs> you know. Uh, <coughs> the only thing actually which I can do, I can create mess, that's for sure. That's I am very expert, <laughs> and we all know this by our own lives. We create so many blunders and mistakes. Uh, so this I mentality, you know, whatever concept of I. So the the only thing, you know, the the concept which we should have, how we should exchange this. I am the servant. I am the servant of the servant of the servant. This is I. This is my real I. And uh, we have to be very watchful uh, during the day, during our sadhana, we have to be very, I mean, we have to come to this consciousness. Nothing depends on me. But during the day, we should not try to enjoy the fruits. You know, something comes to me, why? Because of my greatness, of my skills, of my good qualities. Uh, no, I'm undeserving. I'm just getting it because of the mercy, mercy of the devotees, mercy of people. So that's that's our actually practice. This is called bhajana kriya. Bhajana kriya means you're you're trying to serve. You're trying to be in this mentality of a servant, and not the mentality of the Lord of my survey. You know happy and strong and, you know, beautiful and intelligent. No, no, no. We are not. Or oh, sometimes we try to enjoy the creation by being the most fallen. I am the most fallen. You know, when somebody approached Sila Prabhupada and said, Prabhupada, I am the most fallen. Prabhupada says, you know, the most nobody. Yeah. You're nothing the most. <laughs> You're the most insign insignificant. <laughs> so anyway, that's 
It helps. <laughs> and of course, being with the devotees, as I said, is the key. Yes, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Uh, Maharaj, I have a question about, uh, like, for a sadhaka. So we are practicing sadhana bhakti. So in, uh, like, uh, at sadhaka level, person has to uh, have some human aspect. Like, uh, you know, one of the most basic, uh, some of the basic human needs are like respect and uh, appreciation. So, where does it fit in uh, our philosophy of even 0% hankar and 1%? We want to just uh, reconcile both of them. See, yes, that's a fact. The basic human need is the need to be respected. And uh, being in the society of the devotees gives an ample opportunities of getting the respect as much as we get a lot of prasadam, right? <laughs> That's also a basic human need. You know. But the point is that uh, we should never demand respect. As much as we should not demand prasadam, you know, just give me this prasadam or that prasadam. I, I deserve that much or whatever. We accept. So, with humble heart we accept we accept prasadam and uh, as a response of this we try to develop immediately develop gratitude which is antidote you know if if we are getting respect and taking respect and not uh, uh, manifesting antidote uh, re- gratitude then the respect which we get will have a poisonous effect. It will be tonic, it will be vitamin for our false ego. And, and false ego is not satiable. It, you know, you will never get the position when you say, I'm sick and tired of all this respect. Forget about it. I don't want it anymore. You, you will always... To have, you know, you, you always want to have more and more and more, you know. And, and those people who are not careful, it and they become like it's like a drug. This owner becomes like a drug, and you want more and more and more. You want to enjoy this. Therefore, there has to be, you know, whenever we get the respect, which is good, but we always have to be grateful. As much as, you know, if somebody gives us prasadam, we have to be grateful. Whatever we get, and we'll get. Krishna is giving ample of opportunities to, to get. But in return, we have to be... We, we have actually to try to, every time, to, to do little more in return than, than we got. You know, and, and you, of course, you have practically at least six months a year in front of you the example of Srila Radhan Maharaj if somebody praises him and respects him immediately he responds something you know and you, you can't figure out how he's a, able to counteract <laughs> your praise so quickly <laughs> you know he's just returning it uh, and sometimes returning it ten times or hundred times more you know, that's what we're supposed to do. Yes, it's neat, uh, and we cannot deny unless we reach a very high level when we're completely satisfied in ourselves, in our heart. But then we have to also be careful about it. Hmm? Okay. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Kija, Srila Radhanath Maharaj Kija.